Hi, welcome to my talk, Motion and React. Um, a little bit about me. I've had an interesting journey until I got to this point. I started as a UI engineer at Eventbrite, and then I got really involved with a Yarn package manager. And then I transitioned to 100% full-time working on tools and operations at Netflix. Um, what I thought it would be like working on tools engineer was definitely like this. I was so stoked on my first day. But then by end of the week, I realized it's more like this. Because whatever company you go to, there's tech debt and lots of battles to be fought on multiple fronts. Um, and it's kind of funny that I'm giving this talk because at first, tools and motion design seem very far apart. Right? Oftentimes, CSS makes me feel like this. Don't know what's going on. <laughs> And then learning CSS, I only really have one book that I use. Tend to use it for other things too, as well, if I'm being honest. So there's this current, um, just constant debate um, or an identity crisis between being a tools engineer and a UI engineer. But if I think about what I want to get to in the end is that a good dev tool provides abstraction without hindering knowledge and intuitive and timely feedback, as well as um, portability and integrations into the e existing developer workflow. Good motion design um, provides affordance and contents and accessibility by um, connecting the user to the brand and what it's trying to communicate. And it also conforms native to existing behavior, and this becomes critical in, on platforms like mobile. So both things have this commonality, right? We want better user experience. Developers are users too. Um, and we want to focus on three things, right? Abstraction, feedback, and integration. So that sounds good. I think I'm going to learn about motion. Um, we're going to make some tweets. But like, it's 2018, front end development. You have so many options, right? It makes me feel like this. And this is an apt image, not only because this is how I code, but it describes my learning style, which is bottom up. Because if you think about it, animation and motion is very uh, low level because it depends on so many things like the environment you're working in, the language, the framework you use, and then the libraries that you may choose to use on top of it until you even get to your final code. So let's first talk about the environment, which determines your rendering engine, language, as well as device uh, capabilities. The React ecosystem works across a lot of different platforms, including web, mobile, email, TV, VR, IoT, and it's constantly developing, right? And even platforms like web, you have multiple rendering engines like Gecko and WebKit, and you have to ask yourself questions like, what features do I have available? Do I have things like request animation frame? Do I have HTML and CSS? Um, I ask that because at um, one of the teams that I support in TV UI at Netflix, we don't have a traditional DOM-like environment. Everything is JavaScript. Um, so keeping that in mind, um, you, the environment not only determines what capabilities you could use, but it also should determine how you, des how you design the final product. Um, for example, mobile and desktop. On the left, you see a very familiar uh, swiping motion on the Tinder app, which feels very native and sleek. On the right, you see an ad for Tinder for desktop. First of all, I don't know who's brave enough to use Tinder on desktop. <laughs> and second of all, I don't know who has that kind of computer from the 90s. Um, but if you look past that, even if it's the same visual direction, the difference in dragging uh, versus swiping is um, is not the same for the user. But let's, for the rest of the talk, let's focus on the web because this is the space that we're all familiar with. And we have things like CSS and friends. So first thing, very basic, is CSS transition. Um, it's easy to use. Um, we're familiar with it. It has a declarative API, meaning you just state what you want, and you get things out of the box like browser performance and compatibility. You have uh, more complex features like transition states or um, combining it with other features like media queries. On top of that, you have the superset of uh, CSS animation, which gives you all the benefits of CSS transition, but then you have the keyframe API, so allows you to do things like infinite loops. 
It's important to note that not all CSS properties are equal. You hear a lot saying the gold standard of animation is 60 frames per second. And in a given frame, you have these five process that processes that could happen. Um, anything from uh, running your JavaScript code to filling in the pixels and ordering your elements on the page. And because these happen in a waterfall fashion, um, it means the processes that you invoke earlier will trigger the subsequent processes. So things like opacity and transform are cheaper to use because they trigger pane or composite versus not so cheap properties like width, height, or position that uh, causes a relayout. The goal is to have this entire rendering process happen under 16 milliseconds. So CSS seems pretty great to me. Um, it seems like you get a lot of features out of the box. So when do you actually need JS? JS really comes to shine when you have complex interactions across user behavior or multiple components and data sources. So something like this, the Twitter loading screen, um, is um, something that could be done by CSS because it's fire and forget. It doesn't care about anything else that's happening in the rest of your uh, page or your user interaction. But something like this, where you're scrolling down um, and you want to be, you want to position things relative to the elements on the page, then um, that's where JavaScript comes to shine. And why is that? Because first of all, JavaScript has state management, which allows you to coordinate across different uh, components or data sources. And then secondly, you could interact with the user because it has an event loop. There are a lot of examples in real life where JavaScript can become useful, which is um, notification bar that toggles between uh, success and fail states, um, data visualizations that animate differently based on the data you have, um, other complex interactions with user behavior like page turning, snap to grid, drag and drop, and um, you could even do something complex like game development and storytelling. And the benefit of JavaScript is that it gives us a hook into the rendering process known as request animation frame. So we saw this frame earlier, but if you think of the browser as having a life cycle of many of these frames, set timeout has no idea where in the process it gets executed. So previously, you might have done something like set timeout, animate this element, and do 1,000 divided by 60 for 60 frames per second. But if you use request animation frame, it uh, leaves up to the browser to figure out the best uh, refresh rate. Um, and that means on browsers like Chrome, when your tab is inactive, your animation will run slower. Um, and because each subsequent request animation is guaranteed to be synchronized with your frames, it'll always be called um, at the same, same place, um, which consequently helps you avoid layout thrashing and what's known as jank. Um, if you learn better in dog GIFs, all you need to know is that set timeout, you don't know where things are going, and um, request animation frame, things are called in order. Um, the other benefit to using JavaScript is that the JavaScript community has solved a lot of problems that CSS hasn't yet. Um, this comes to problems around modularity, portability, and testability. We have frameworks like Jest and Babel to um, use the features in advance. Um, and we could also do something really complex like 3D rendering. And we're actually experimenting that at Netflix right now. Um, we use this in-depth transition using 3D rendering techniques. Um, and we also need JavaScript here because the recommendations you get will determine what box images you get. And based on that, we might want to set a different priority. So like, JavaScript is better than CSS, right? Obviously. Um, but what's interesting is that we're coming to a place <laughs> where um, JavaScript and CSS are coming together. Um, hopefully not that violently. Uh, where we talked about this before, but separations of concerns is not happening just by language, but by components and functionality. Um, and we already have an existing solution for this. Um, you probably heard of CSS and JS. Um, uh, Style Components is one of these libraries, and they support CSS features like keyframes out of the box. What's more interesting is that there is an experimental API on the web, which gives a first-class citizen status to web animation. So it means that elements on the DOM will natively have support for uh, methods like animate, or pause, or play, or finish. Um, another effort is to expose the internals of CSS rendering um, to developers in a cross-browser effort known as Houdini. So um, 
I have a couple examples, which is CSS typed object model, which is actually already available on Chrome. Um, so previously, to animate using JavaScript, you would have to read the value of an element. Um, but the value you set it to, let's say you set opacity to some numerical value, when you read it, you'll get a string, and then you'd have to parse it, and then you'd have to add some uh, math, and, and then reset it again. Um, so the typed object model uh, prevents or improves this situation by creating um, an attribute style map that kind of guarantees this, uh, a stricter type check against the attribute you're setting. And this way, it improves the interoperability between CSS and JavaScript. Another cool feature coming is custom CSS properties and paint API. So this means you could register custom CSS properties in the rendering engine that you're running, um, as well as uh, your own methods. And you can unlock more right now by going to Chrome slash flags. So let's talk about the next step, which is the framework. The framework determines the libraries and code you use based on your programming paradigm and priorities. In React, we care about two things, among others. Um, first is functional reactive programming. Second is composition and abstraction. There are a lot of third-party animation libraries that we could use. Right. We, you've heard of GSAP or Anime, 3JS, Lottie. Um, I picked Pop Motion because it plays really well with the functional, pro functional programming paradigm. Um, so you see an example code here where um, you pass a ref to React, and then um, you kind of leave it to this third-party library because React isn't opinionated, opinionated about how you um, decide to animate. But um, so you get these native pros, uh, which are it's performant, browser compatible, community tested. The downside, however, is that it requires DOM access, right? And we're kind of trained as React developers to avoid that when possible. Um, and you don't get access to React lifecycle methods e either. Um, so if we think about what do we actually need React for, it's the second part, which is composition and abstraction. This is what React was made, uh, meant to do. Um, there are a couple community solutions out there. React Transition Group actually used to be part of React add-ons, but was uh, moved to a separate open source package. Um, transition basically um, gives you, uh, passes down transition states to children components. So you have things like entering and entered and exited, exiting and exited. Um, the main benefit of this is that it just provides an abstraction layer. It's not going to tell you how to animate. But um, because React doesn't have anything like should component unmount, um, this component gives you sort of to artificially control the state without unmounting the component completely. Um, while transition is a primitive component, you have one, we have one level up, which is CSS transition. So this actually t uh, specifies which class name to look for. So on your style sheet, um, you would enter the class name and how to animate based on enter or um, exit states. And transition group, finally, is the, um, um, just the way to orchestrate different transition components um, by toggling between in and out states. Um, another popular library is known as React Motion. Um, this is basically an abstraction of Spring Motion. So with CSS, you really only have control over two different um, parameters, right, distance and timing. But now that we're in JavaScript and in the scripting world, it means we could apply any kind of you know, complex rule of physics if we want, like Hooke's Law. Um, so it has this reduced like syntax where the subsequent um, styles will be applied to the uh, next, uh, next uh, child. Um, the overall effect of using React Motion is that it has this lifelike weight to it. Um, so Spring Motion is not something new to web, um, uh, new to the world, like anima animators on Pixar films use Spring Motion to give this lifelike quality. Um, and React Motion is an implementation of that. But, okay, so we talked about a lot of things, right? So what if I want everything, right? I want CSS and JS, I want functional programming, I want React components. 
Um, there's a solution to that by animating with styled components and React Pose. So React Pose was written um, by the same folks who did Pop Motion. Um, so you see that declarative functional-like style where I'm just giving one object uh, with two different states, either full screen or thumbnail mode, and this just becomes a component that gets passed in the prop what, how it should render. And the cool thing is I actually don't have to tell React Pose if I want to animate based on a tween or a swing motion, based on the properties that you configure, it'll auto-magically figure that out for you and leave that decision out from the developer. So the TLDR of this talk is to have motion be part of your design spec, right? We're, we've been introduced to concepts like GraphQL and React Suspense, where you have these different uh, loading states waiting for data fetching to occur, and that's just an additional slice of time that you could delight the user with uh, motion. Secondly, you want to have a framework for introducing frameworks. Um, while all of the libraries are cool, you really want to balance the pros of performance or having more control or uh, things like comp composition or reusability with the cons, like introducing a more um, complex build process, or getting a bigger bundle size, or increasing developer overhead. So, thanks. <laughs>